We're going to be continuing our messages on total fitness and um, the section that we're focusing on is emotional fitness and what a walk with God does in the realm of our emotions and when our emotions are healthy. Some of us don't like to pay very much attention to emotions. We have them, but we prefer to keep them very well moderated and modulated if we could, and we prefer not to show them too much. The painful emotions are ones, of course, we prefer to avoid simply because they're painful and we don't like feeling bad. But sometimes we even avoid the more pleasant emotions because by now we're old enough to know they don't last anyway. Um, we're going to have our ups and downs and so we don't want to get too high because then it hurts more when they go down again. Or we may have other reasons for just not wanting to feel too much, either too much um, painful emotion or too much of the more positive emotions. And because we're that way, we sometimes have help even from our pastors and Bible scholars telling us that emotions don't matter all that much anyway. What really matters is correct belief and proper behavior. If you believe the right things about God and behave the way you should, don't worry too much if your feelings, uh, whatever they might be, uh, just don't worry about them too much. The feelings will either take care of themselves or be assured they don't matter all that much. If one were to read the Bible, you might not get that impression. If you read the Psalms, it's I'm rejoicing or I am in the pit, O oh Lord. What am I doing here and are you going to get me out? And you have great swings of emotion in the Psalms and in the rest of the Bible. When it's talking about real um, life in the Lord, it's talking about joy and peace and a love and all sorts of things that are very much in the realm of feeling. And we're told, yes, but joy and happiness, they're very different things. Well, thanks for that information. I wouldn't have known it if I hadn't had an expert to tell me. Because, you know, when I'm joyful, I'm, I'm feeling kind of happy. Uh, or they'll say, you know, love is an action. It's a decision, not a feeling. And so you look your wife in the eye and say, I am having a decision about you today, dear. Um, well, yeah, I, love is more than a feeling, but is it less than a feeling? Joy may be more than a feeling, and the foundations of your joy matter a lot. And we're going to see some more of that, but to say that joy has nothing to do with happiness, well, I think it does. Um, these things that the Bible speaks about, the peace that surpasses understanding, may be more than just a feeling, but if it doesn't involve any feeling of calm and rest in God, are we really talking about peace anymore? Feelings matter. And to be told that when in a sense, you don't have the right feelings, makes it even worse. Well, I know I'm supposed to have joy, and I don't, so that makes me even grumpier. <laughs> so talking about positive feelings and being told they're important when you don't have them is not exactly a helpful prospect in some ways. And yet, and yet it is important to pay some attention to our feelings, even if it's not something that we enjoy doing. Um, Dan Allender and Trimper Longman wrote a book uh, about the Psalms, and in particular about the Psalms of struggle or disorientation. They called it the cry of the soul and what our feelings tell us about ourself and God. And they write, the reason we don't want to feel is that feeling exposes the tragedy of our world and the darkness of our hearts. To be aware of what we feel can open us up to questions we would rather ignore. For many of us, that's why it's easier not to. To feel. But a failure to feel leaves us barren and distant from God and others. It is important to pay attention to our feelings because our equipment for feeling is part of the equipment God has given us for knowing Him and for knowing ourselves. It's not the only equipment. There's the rational and logical um, and propositional uh, aspect of our lives and other things too. But feeling is part of how we experience life, how we experience God, how we experience who we are as ourselves. And to ignore it can keep us pretty tone deaf to who we are and to who God is. So um, emotional fitness, as we've already seen in previous messages, when your emotions are fit, they're in tune with reality and they feel 
reality very deeply. And when you're really in tune with emotion, and emotion is in tune with reality, you learn some things. Life is far worse than I dare to admit. Life is far better than I dare to dream. I am far worse than I dare to admit. And I am far greater than I dare to dream. God is far harsher than I dare to fear. God is far kinder than I dare to hope. And we are more comfortable living somewhere in the mediocre middle of all of that, when in fact, if we were willing to see both the depths and the heights, then we would be more in touch with reality. When God's Spirit comes near and touches your spirit, you will feel some things very intensely. And you will have a greater awareness of God and of what's going on in your life and in the world than if you're not paying attention to those. Because God's Spirit touches our spirit. And He impacts how we feel. He also touches our mind. And we've seen what it means to have the mind of Christ and the mind of the Spirit. But He does touch the Spirit. The Spirit testifies with our spirit that we're God's children. And He testifies with our spirit in a lot of other ways as well. When you read the book of Acts and other parts of the Bible too, but I'll just focus on the book of Acts for now. When God's Spirit comes close to people and touches them, they have extremely painful emotional experiences. When Peter spoke to people on the day of Pentecost and said, you nailed Jesus to a cross and God raised him to life, they said, whoa, no! They were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Later on, there um, are some people who are trying to imitate what the apostles of Jesus are doing, and they try to drive out some demons. And the demons instead just come on those phony exorcists and beat the, and, you know, the, the, the demon-possessed guy just beats the soup out of the people who are trying to do the job, you know, and the Bible says that everybody was seized with fear and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Many of those who believe now came and openly confessed their evil deeds. And you'll read in many parts of Acts um, when Ananias and Sapphira, for example, dropped dead for lying about their giving. Um, the, the whole church is filled with fear. When God comes near, there is sometimes a sense of fear and terror. And if you read not just in the book of Acts, but then in later histories of revival, when God is especially and intensively at work by the Holy Spirit in people's hearts and lives, very often people have this overwhelming sense of how horrible they are in the face of God and how serious their sins are. And they fall down on their faces right in the middle. They don't care even if other people are watching in some of these meetings where God's Spirit came upon them. They would be so overwhelmed with horror that they'd, they'd confess their sins right on the spot. They, they just couldn't help it. They were so overwhelmed with, with pain and terror of God's judgment and horror of their sin. And they had these intensely painful feelings precisely because God was near. The Spirit was touching their spirit, and it hurt a lot. But if you read the book of Acts and look at the history of revival, you also find something else going on when God's Spirit comes near. You find um, positive feelings. Pleasant is hardly a strong enough word to describe it, but I just chose it because it's kind of the opposite of painful. When the gospel came to the people of Samaria in a city there, uh, they received Christ, and the Bible says there was great joy in that city as people believed the message of the evangelist Philip. When Philip went later and was called by the Spirit to meet a, an African official, uh, Secretary of the Treasury for the Queen of Ethiopia, he's riding in his chariot, he's reading from the scroll of Isaiah, and Philip um, just is brought right next to the chariot, and he says, do you understand what you're reading? The man says, how can I unless someone explains to me? And then Philip explains Isaiah 53, um, he was despised and rejected by men. Um, he's borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. And Philip explains to him that this is about Jesus dying for you and taking away your sins. And the official says, well, what's to prevent me from being baptized? And Philip says, nothing. I see some water. Let's, let's do it. 
So he's baptized, and then he gets back in his chariot, and he's heading back for Ethiopia again. And the last thing we see of him, the Bible says he went on his way rejoicing. You keep reading another sample from the book of Acts. The disciples are attacked and oppressed in a city, and they've been spreading the gospel. Now they arouse some very intense opposition. And the Bible says the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. When they get to Philippi carrying the gospel, Paul and Silas are attacked and beaten and imprisoned because they've driven out an evil spirit that had been in a girl that gave her the power of fortune telling. And so they have been um, badly, badly mistreated. They're locked in the jail and it's about midnight and they're praying and singing hymns to God. They are having a hymn sing right in the middle of the jail and the other prisoners are listening to them. What causes that? Well, it's that they are very close to God, even as they're suffering for the sake of the gospel. And the Holy Spirit touches their spirit and gives them tremendous joy. And then there's an earthquake, and the jailer is about to kill himself because all the doors have fallen off of the prison, and he thinks all the prisoners have escaped. And so he goes suicidal. But Paul says, don't do it. And the jailer says, what must I do to be saved? Because he's probably heard some of those hymns in the prison too and knows there's something different about these men than what his life has been. And Paul says, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your whole household. And so he believes, his whole household is baptized. And the last thing we read of him, he was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole family. That's the keynote of the book of Acts is the joy of people who've been coming to know the Lord and whose hearts are being touched and transformed by the Holy Spirit. This tremendous experience of happiness in God. And if you were to read in the um, history of revivals where God's Spirit has been touching and transforming people in wonderful ways, whether it's um, the revival in America at the time of the Great Awakening and Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield and John Wesley and their preaching, or whether you read about the Great Revival in the Congo in the 1950s or read about the revival in Korea in the early 1900s in which the gospel swept across that nation and where there were almost no Christians and suddenly the church grew by leaps and bounds. You find that people are downcast I mean, Jonathan Edwards would preach a sermon like sinners in the hands of an angry God, and people would be cut to the heart by that, and they would be wailing and crying out in repentance. But then you also find that Edwards writes about never was the town so full of joy and so much gladness among the people. And Edwards' wife would speak of just a, a, a spirit of singing in her heart all the time. Um, you read in the Congo or the Korean revival, too, after being downcast and filled with such sorrow, they have just this tremendous excitement and gladness that comes from the joy of the Lord. So you have both. You have this range of feeling. And I would suggest that if you want to talk about emotional fitness, your emotions are most fit when you are being touched most by the Holy Spirit of God. And your range of emotions widens quite a bit when you are in touch with God's spirit and your spirit is sensing his spirit, you're going to sometimes feel worse perhaps than you've ever felt before and better than you have ever felt before. Your uh, healthy uh, emotional life is, among other things, a life with range um, that the Holy Spirit just gives you this range of emotion in response both to the horrors of sin, to the sadness of the world, to the fallenness of the human condition, um, to the suffering of people around you, to the plight of those who are without Christ, you'll feel intensely. Paul said, I have unceasing sorrow in my heart for my fellow Jews who don't believe. He had a tremendous sadness. That didn't mean that he didn't feel joy at the same time over salvation and what God's people were doing, but he could feel that great sadness, and that's healthy emotions because it is a terrible state to be in, to be lost without Christ. And when you feel that for other people, and especially if you're lost yourself and you're feeling it for yourself, that's often the first step to coming to know Christ. Sometimes the Holy Spirit deals with different people differently. Very often he gives the intense sorrow and sense of lostness first, and then this sense of joy. But there are other people with whom 
He actually deals with it in the reverse manner. There are people whose life has already been tough or um, who already feel worthless. And the first thing they find when they meet Jesus or hear the good news and the Holy Spirit touches them is they're just so glad that there is somebody like that, that there is God who is good, who is powerful, who gives um, such blessing and who poured himself out for them. And their first experience of the Holy Spirit is just right away joy and being loved and being overwhelmed with that. And then later on sometimes they'll have a sense of their unworthiness and terrible sorrow. Because God deals with people oftentimes in the manner and order that we need it. He deals with us according to his wisdom. And some people, he, he just chooses to pour out those good feelings first and then the sense of deeper conviction sometimes later on and then lifts them up again. So there is no formula for an order or how God does it, but we should realize that one thing he does do is that he does touch our hearts very deeply and stirs our emotions very, very much. Just to take a few uh, samples of blessing from uh, the Apostle Paul. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. When we look at uh, positive feelings, I want, there's a lot of them that you could focus on, depending on how you categorize them. But I want to look at hope and joy, purity and dignity, peace and love. Hope is a sense that the future is good. And joy is an experience right now of happiness, of gladness, of what God is doing. Purity is the sense of being clean, of being right. Dignity is the sense of being important, worthwhile, having a purpose. Peace is calm, rest, being um, on good terms with God and with other people and in your own heart. Love is the sense of being loved as well as of loving, of feeling a great affection and love towards God uh, and also feeling great love and affection toward other people, and along with those feelings, of course, taking the actions that are appropriate to rejoicing in somebody else and desiring their honor and their well-being. So we have uh, these pleasant feelings, and the Bible talks about them a great deal. That what, what I'm going to give is just a very, very, very tiny sample of these feelings, these positive feelings that we find in the Scripture. The psalmists often say, I will have hope, or I will hope in the Lord, or sometimes they talk to themselves and say, hope in God, but hope is a big part of our life of feeling. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, and hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. You can't separate these emotions one from another. When you're loved, you have hope, but when you're loved by God, you know you have tremendous hope for the future. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. And the joy of the Lord is a constant theme of Scripture. So this, this sense of hope in the future and knowing that, that the future is not dark and ruinous, but a glad future gives you great hope in, in your feelings. And joy is just the experience right now of, of well-being, of gladness, of happiness in God. Now, in, uh, in talking about painful feelings in a previous message, I said, hey, painful feelings aren't always bad. They're very helpful. They are things that can help us sense real realities about God and ourselves. And so we shouldn't just say, let's get rid of all painful feelings and shoot only for pleasant ones, because painful feelings can be helpful for the Christian. Now I have to make the opposite point. Pleasant feelings for a Christian can be a wonderful thing, but you can be someone who's totally lost and have pleasant feelings for all the wrong reasons. There is warped hope. There is warped and misguided joy. The wicked swallow up the righteous and they enjoy doing it. The wicked foe rejoices and is glad. Here the prophet is talking about the marauding armies of Babylon. And they have a delightful time burning cities, raping women. They are having a great time of it, and they have hope. There are more places that Babylon can conquer. 
They have joy. We are having a great time doing this conquering. But the wicked are, are having those feelings for all the wrong reasons. Their hope and their joy is based on some very bad things. In the book of Revelation, it speaks of two witnesses. And I won't get into the interpretation of who those two witnesses are or who they represent. I just want to make the point now that when those two witnesses are killed, the inhabitants of the earth have tremendous joy and their hope is renewed. Because those two witnesses of God had been warning them of bad things to come. And so when they go down and are murdered, then there is a new hope that goodness is not going to prevail. There is joy that they're dead. The inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them and will celebrate by sending each other gifts. So just because you have hope, just because you have joy, does not mean that you are emotionally healthy. You might have hope and joy about all the wrong things. King Belshazzar of Babylon had a tremendous celebration. He gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles. Banqueting is an occasion of fun feelings, of positivity. And in the middle of the banquet, a hand wrote on the wall, meeny, meeny, tiku, parson. And when the prophet Daniel explains what it means, it means you have been found in the balance, and you've been weighed in the balance and found wanting, and you are going to die tonight, and the city will be conquered. So there is such a thing as having your banquets of hope, and joy, and all the time there is a hand hovering, waiting to write God's judgment over your life. So hope and joy can be warped. And so when we look at our own feelings, we shouldn't just say, well, you know, I, I'm feeling pretty good right now. All is well. Not necessarily. It depends what your hope and joy are based on. The prospect of the righteous is joy, but the hopes of the wicked come to nothing. When a wicked man dies, his hope perishes. All he expected from his power comes to nothing. You may be an optimist. You may feel great about the future. Um, the, the man in Jesus' story who said, Hey, self, take life easy. Um, build some bigger barns. Fill up your bank accounts more and more. Eat, drink, and be merry. Life is good. And God says, You fool, tonight your soul is required of you. The man had false hope. His hope was in his money, and his money and he were easily parted. But when it comes to genuine hope and joy, getting back to that again, the Bible says we have this hope in Christ, this future given us by Christ as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. In the book of Nehemiah, it tells about some people who are going through a time of spiritual revival. And the first thing that happened was the sorrow. Ezra was reading the law of God, the word of God, and it was being explained by his fellow Levites. And as the people heard that, they were very disturbed because they realized how far they had fallen from God and how their lives did not at all measure up to God's purposes for them. And they began to weep and to cry. And then Nehemiah, the governor, goes to them and he says, Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And, they get, and then a celebration takes off. So there was that sorrow, but now Nehemiah says, yeah, but God's brought this sorrow on you for a good purpose, and now it's time to turn on the joy because God has brought his word near to you, and he's renewing you, and he's giving new hope to the nation, and the joy of the Lord is what makes us strong. There may be a time where weeping is healthy, but your strength comes with rejoicing in the Lord. And Jesus himself, when he is speaking to his disciples on that Thursday night before his crucifixion, tells them many things about his love and his peace, about abiding in him and he in them, how they're like uh, uh, branches of him being the vine. And he says, I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and so that your joy may be complete. Jesus wants us to be joyful. That's the short version. He tells us these things. He gives us himself so that we can rejoice in him and so that our joy will be complete. So if your emotions are healthy, they're going to have a lot of hope and joy in the Lord that's, that's founded on the Lord and not just on uh, feeling good about plundering another city or just having things going your way in life. A real hope and joy are feelings, but they're feelings that are rooted in reality that comes from God. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. You believe in him, says Peter, and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy 
For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Hope comes from the God of hope. Joy comes from the fact that your souls are saved and you're going to receive the goal of your faith. So hope and joy, they go together. They're rooted in the work of the Holy Spirit in you. They're rooted in the fact that God is the God of hope and joy. So simply to know him is to have hope and joy come more and more into your life. And when your soul is saved, when you can look forward to that future of hope, then you're going to be filled with hope and joy in believing. Another um, pair of positive or pleasant feelings is the, the feeling of being pure and the feeling of being important or valuable or dignified or having a purpose. In 1 Corinthians 6, the Apostle Paul talks about a variety of lifestyles and shameful behaviors and terrible sins. And he says, that's what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And to be justified is to be declared right with God. To be sanctified is to be set apart by God. To be washed is to be purified and made clean by God. And you ought to feel like it. When God has declared you pure and clean in His sight, do you have the right to go around saying, mm -hmm, you know, there, there is the healthy conviction of sin, but when God declares you right, and when He's at work in your life making you pure... It's okay to feel pure, to say, I'm as white as snow. God has cleansed me, and I am so happy and thankful to him. I feel pure. It's okay to feel dignity. It's okay to feel important. Jesus is the one who said, you are the light of the world. The Bible is what says, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. Our family receives Christmas card from uh, boys or, and their family that played on my basketball team at one point. And the, the card is always signed, the royal family. And we always laugh about that. But they, uh, the, their name isn't royal. I didn't give their real name, but it's the royal blank family because they, they're royalty. And so we kind of laugh about that, but that's actually what God says. You are the royal priesthood. You are the chosen people. You, you belong to God. And so to have that kind of importance, to be told that someday you're going to be among those who are judging the world and judging the angels and seated with Christ on his throne, and even now you're called to reign with him and make a difference in his world, these are great and high purposes. These are statements of how important you are in God's plan. And you ought to feel that way. You ought to feel that God has made you clean and God has called you to high and great things and to feel the dignity that goes with that. And again, there are ways of being warped in our feelings of purity and dignity. Proverbs says there are those who are pure in their own eyes and yet are not cleansed of their filth. They might sing, um, Blessed assurance, I am so pure, I am superior, I am so sure. You know, that's the, that's the version of blessed assurance that they might sing. And the Pharisees knew how to sing blessed assurance. God, I thank you that I am not like other men. So you can, you can feel pure and you can feel important but what is the foundation of those feelings of purity and importance? If the purity is not founded on the blood of Jesus Christ and on the work of the Holy Spirit, then you've got the wrong version of blessed assurance going. If it's not founded on what God does in you rather than what you think you've worked your way into in God's favor, then you're just praying like the Pharisee, God, I feel superior and thank you for making me so superior to everybody else. So you can have a warped sense of purity and dignity, and we need to be aware of that and be aware of the hypocrisy that goes with it. But in trying to avoid warped purity and dignity, we should also avoid the notion that you are feeling what God wants you to feel when you always feel dirty and when you always feel worthless. 
Because God does not call his children, purified by the blood of Jesus, to always feel dirty. Those whom he has exalted and lifted up and appointed to great importance in his kingdom, he does not call to feel worthless and without purpose in the world. So, you can have a poor foundation for your sense of purity and dignity, but you are actually designed to feel pure and important because originally you were created in God's image and you are renewed in the image of Christ by the Holy Spirit if you belong to him. So if you belong to the Lord, then you are to feel that purity and dignity. And the Apostle Paul says, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he wants people right now to be sanctified through and through in their whole life and, and to know that they have this purity in Christ. And dignity, the Apostle said, There is in store for me the crown of righteousness. He was expecting a crown. That's not the, I feel so worthless. This was a man who could say, I'm the chief of sinners, but he could also say, I am counting on the crown of righteousness. I'm counting on reigning with Christ. And he could also say, hey, I, I, I did terrible things, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And God's been doing mighty things through me. So if your emotions are healthy and they're based on healthy realities, then be glad if you feel pure in Christ. Be glad if you feel like you have a high and important and dignified calling. And if you don't feel that way, you can't just kind of crank yourself into feeling pure and crank yourself up to feel more dignified. But if you belong to Christ, just get in touch with reality. That's the place to start. Pay attention to who you are in Christ. And when you're in touch with that reality, you will begin to feel more pure. And if you don't, then it's, then it's time to examine, now what's causing my feeling of impurity? Is it because the sin is so great still in me? Or is it because something is blocking me from my true inheritance of really feeling and enjoying the purity that's mine in Christ? As I mentioned in a previous message, if we get stuck in negative feelings even though we're a believer, there may be bodily problems. Your body can affect your feelings. And so if your feelings are out of whack, it's sometimes helpful just to address the bodily problems that may have thrown your feelings into an unhealthy spiral. Or there may have been traumas or wicked things done to you that haven't been healed yet. And even though you're in Christ and, and you have the right to feel pure and dignified in Him, just scripts that were pounded into your mind by cruel or wicked parents or other people who did terrible things to you, can still be poisoning how you feel. And sometimes it's helpful to have a wise Christian counselor to help you get through that so that your feelings will more and more come in tune with the reality of who you are in Christ. So I'm just saying that when, when your feelings don't match up with who you, the Bible tells you you are in Christ, then it would be a wise thing to try to understand why that's happening and then to get it dealt with so that you can be healthier and more whole in the Lord Jesus Christ. But above all, make sure you're staying in touch with the reality. Pay attention to what God says about you. You are justified. You are right in God's eyes if you put your faith in Jesus. You are pure. The Holy Spirit is cleansing you every day to make you more and more pure. And you're to count yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus, not to grovel and say, I am worthless and I am wicked. Sometimes you have to confess wickedness and, and worthlessness if your life has slid into that. But to say that is the reality of my life and that is the humble thing to feel, that's not sound thinking. Because New Testament thinking in the Holy Spirit is that I am pure and I matter. Peace and love are another of those positive pairs. The peace of God which transcends all understanding. That comes to you when you lay your burdens before the Lord, when you're not anxious before Him. And then the peace of God that transcends all understanding guards your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Paul says that he wants Christ to dwell in our hearts through faith and that being rooted and established in love will have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. To know this love, to know this peace, to, 
to have God's Spirit in our heart telling us that we're beloved children of God and that God is our Abba, our Father. This is the normal experience of a healthy Christian. This is what it means to be emotionally fit when you're in the Lord, that, that you're at peace, that you're calm and resting in Him, and that you know you are loved, and that you feel great love for Him and great love for other people. The Apostle, again, just to take one of his blessings, peace be to the brothers, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This tremendous peace and love is, is meant to be your birthright, brothers and sisters. And so don't settle for less than that. If, if you're living without peace, or if you have no sense of being loved, and it's hard for you to feel affection towards others, then instead of saying, I've got to get used to that, I guess, because that's just the way life is, that's who I am. No! That's not the way life is. That's not who you are. You're meant to be at peace. You are meant to know that you are loved and to feel affection for others. And if that's not going on at all, then there's something unhealthy in your emotional life and stop pretending. Address it and ask God to help you with that. There is warped peace and love, as with all the other positive emotions. There are people who feel at peace. Peace, peace, they say, when there is no peace. When people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly. The people listening to Noah's preaching were not saying, ah, ah, there's a flood coming, there's a flood coming, the man has a big boat. They were saying, what is that idiot doing? And they were feeling perfectly at peace until the flood came and took them all away. And the Bible says before Jesus' second coming, it's going to be peace and safety. Oh, what are these nutcases who talk about Jesus' return to judge the living and the dead? What are they even talking about? Uh, we're safe. And then it says destruction will come on them suddenly. So you can have warped peace. And you can have warped love. You can love the wrong things. How long will you love delusions and seek false gods? You can love a god of your own making. You can love stuff. Um, you can love evil rather than good, as Psalm 52 puts it. You can love evil. So you can feel affection um, of a sort, but for all the wrong gods and for all the wrong things. And so we need to be, uh, again, aware that just because I happen to feel a sense of peace that life is going okay, um, or that I feel affection for certain kinds of things, does not mean that my emotions are healthy because they're directed at the wrong things. Jesus says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. The Father himself loves you because you have loved me and believed that I came from God. He says, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. That's the basis for the peace. Not that you're never going to have trouble, but that you take heart because Jesus has overcome the world. And in his great prayer, Jesus says, Father, I've made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. This love that God the Father himself has for Jesus and Jesus for the Father is the very love that he plants in us so that we are loved in the very same way that God has loved his Son from all eternity. And that as the Holy Spirit works in us, that love starts to come out of our hearts so that we have that love for Jesus and the Father that the Father and Jesus have for each other in the bond of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus gives this peace and this love and it's meant to be my experience, and yours. And part of making it more and more your experience isn't just tweaking on your emotions and doing a lot of introspection. The main thing is to look to Jesus. Look to the Father. Focus your mind on the facts of what the Holy Spirit is doing in you. And the more you get in tune with those realities, the more your emotions are going to start feeling those realities as God's Spirit touches your spirit. The God of love and peace will be with you. It's not just that he gives love and peace. He is the God of love. He is the God of peace. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace 
at all times and in every way. Love and peace are really just part of what the Bible says, that we become partakers of the divine nature. When you're experiencing and encountering God, you're going to experience love and peace because He's the God of love and He's the God of peace. So, when you explore your emotions, we may sometimes avoid that because we're a little too scared of the painful feelings and we're a little distrustful of the positive ones. We just don't think they might last or we, we know we have our ups and downs. But if you explore your emotions, you can um, become more honest with yourself you can become more in tune with God as you pay attention to those things. And we've been talking about pleasant feelings today. Just ask yourself, we've talked about the misguided or warped kind, as well as the healthy kind, and here's some questions for sorting them out a bit. Just because you feel things doesn't mean you don't have to think. Part of dealing with your feelings is discernment, sorting them through and deciding, you know, some of these feelings are misguided, others, they, I have a right to feel that way. So how do you know? Well, what triggers you to feel hope and joy or purity and dignity or peace and love? If the trigger is God's work in you and the hope that you have in the Holy Spirit and in God's promises of eternal life and the fact that your soul is saved, um, those are great triggers. If you say there is another town to pillage and more women to rape, you know, those, that would be a really bad trigger for your feelings of hope and of happiness. And, and, of course, I'm taking an extreme example, but you know there may be other things in your life that give you uh, a warm vibe that shouldn't. How do your feelings affect your behavior? I've been making the point that feelings matter, and don't believe those who say feelings don't matter at all. But if all you're doing is feeling a warm and fuzzy love towards somebody and you never help anybody, well, come on, um, does it actually affect your behavior? If you say, I feel peace, and then you act like a worry wart, uh, then it's time to bring your uh, behavior in tune with the right feelings that you have in the Lord. What are your pleasant feelings saying about reality? The great realities of God's reign, of Christ's coming again, of the new kingdom. You ought to feel good about that, okay? These are great things, and you ought to feel great about them. When you're dealing with others, do you feel sorrow in your heart for the perishing? Do you feel joy when you hear from missionaries and when you hear the advances of God's kingdom? Do you, uh, do you just feel a, a sense of wonder at what God is doing in their lives and, and in God himself? Can you rejoice in him? Do your pleasant feelings point, what do they point to in your heart and God's heart? Because that good feeling God gives you about having him as your father, let that carry you a while and and just to enjoy having such a father and to learn more and more about his great heart of love. And the more you get in tune with what his spirit is doing in your spirit, the better you're going to know God. And as I've um, emphasized before, do your pleasant feelings outweigh the painful feelings and do they outlast the painful feelings? Because you're going to feel a mixture. But which is dominant in your life? It's important to be able to address those questions because... You're going to have mixed feelings. I'll just take a little sample from Paul. Uh, we're, we're going to have a mix. Uh, the Bible itself says rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. At almost any given time, I know some people are sad about something and other people are really excited and happy about something. And if I'm going to uh, feel with both kinds, then I'm going to have mixed feelings just for their sake. Never mind what's going on in my own life. The apostle says, well, through, he's living through glory and dishonor, bad report and good report. Genuine, yet regarded as impostors. Known, yet regarded as unknown. So God knows him, but other people are thinking he's totally unimportant. Dying, and yet we live on. Beaten, and yet not killed. Sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. You see the mixture there? Sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Poor, yet making many rich. Having nothing, yet possessing everything. When you're living in this world, which is a mixed bag you're going to have mixed feelings. But when you're living in a world where God gets the final word, then your mixed feelings are going to have the predominant note of God's triumph. So emotional fitness involves being in tune with reality and others and God. You display your emotions appropriately. It's linked with the other parts of total fitness. It helps you to sense true realities, deep realities, which you're going to overlook if you don't let your feelings teach you something. It gives you hints of what's going on in your heart, what's going on 
in God's heart. And if you ignore your feelings entirely, you're going to miss out on things you could learn about God's heart. And as I've repeated again and again, you're going to feel pain. You're going to have unpleasant feelings. But those are limited in duration. They are limited in power. And the pleasure of God, the blessing of God is unlimited in amount and unlimited in how long it lasts. And your emotions are healthy when you feel that way, when you feel that God's greatness and his goodness outweigh anything else that's painful in my life. Let's pray together. Dear Father, we pray that you will indeed fill us with all joy and peace in believing as we trust in you. We pray that you will give us that peace that surpasses all understanding, the love beyond all knowledge, the joy unspeakable and full of glory. We pray, Lord, that more and more our hearts will be filled with the reality of the Holy Spirit in us, that the way we think, the way we feel, the way we act and conduct ourselves will shine with the presence and the light of Jesus Christ. Lord, if some of us need to feel intensely the negative feelings that would expose our sin and um, the weaknesses in ourselves, then we open ourselves to you for that. And we ask that your spirit will cut us to the heart. And Lord, some of us desperately need the healing. We, we've been bogged down in the painful feelings for far too long. And so by your Holy Spirit, bring that about. Remove all obstacles to the flood of joy that you have reserved for us. Remove anything that blocks us from knowing your love and from releasing that love towards others. And restore our hearts that we may truly be emotionally in tune with you and be healthy by the work of the Holy Spirit. We pray in his name.